Hello and welcome to Semiconductor Devices and Materials. I am your course instructor for today to guide you to the first topic of this course which is Introduction to Semiconductor. As the name suggests, in this topic we will talk about the fundamental properties of semiconductor and then further on in this course we will discuss about the advanced devices we can develop with these semiconductors. As this is a video session, I would encourage you to pause and play again the topics or the parts that seem a bit hazy at first. I am sure this pause and play technique will help you to clear things a lot better. So without any further ado, let's dive in to our first topic, Introduction to Semiconductor. So to start the discussion about Semiconductor, let's first understand what Semiconductor actually is. Let's divide the name Semiconductor into two parts, Semi and Conductor. What is conductor? Conductor is something that allows electron to pass through it or in other sense a material which allows current to flow through it. This is what conductor is. On the other hand, a material which doesn't allow electron or current to pass through it is called an insulator. Semi means something in, in between. So semiconductor is a material which has properties somewhere in between insulator and conductor. In terms of conductivity, semiconductor are those materials which allows electron or current to current to pass through them under certain conditions. If we analyze this definition in terms of conductivity of a material, we will get a better view of it. So what is conductivity? From the Ohm's law, we know about resistivity R. Conductivity is actually the reciprocal or inverse of resistivity. The more the conductivity of a material, the better conductor it is. From the chart, we can see that the, the conductivity of metal is 63 10 to the power 6, which is very large amount. And the resistivity, which is the inverse of conductivity, is actually pretty low. On the other hand, an insulator has a conductivity of 1 10 to the power minus 16 which is a very less amount and, and on the other hand resistivity is quite large so that explains the conductivity of metal and an insulator so in the case of semiconductor we can see that the conductivity is not as high as metal and also not as low as insulator it is somewhere in between so that is why semiconductor is called a semiconductor so what are the important features of semiconductors the bonding, band gap energy and carrier concentration, we will talk about these properties shortly. So bonding forces in solids. So let's talk about the popular bonds we come across in solids, ionic bond, metallic bond and covalent bond. In the case of ionic bond, one element donates its electron to another. So let's talk about the most popular ionic compound, sodium chloride. When sodium chloride is formed, one electron from the outer shell of the sodium is removed and that electron is accepted by the chlorine atom. What happens is, by giving up the only electron in the outer shell of sodium, it achieves a steady state of 8 electrons in the outer shell. And when the chlorine atom accepts that electron, it also forms that same stable state where there is 8 electrons in the outer shell. So as the sodium ion is giving up one of its electrons, it becomes a cation, which is sodium plus. And as the chlorine atom is accepting an electron, it becomes a negatively charged chloride ion. Then the electrostatic force between these positive and negative ions creates the ionic one. So NaCl is a good insulator because the electrons are now tightly bound and there are no free electrons which can help the current to flow to sodium chloride. So as we talked about sodium chloride, similar things happen when calcium chloride is formed, except the difference is in this case, one calcium atom gives up two electrons and two chlorine atoms accept one electron each. And so a cation of calcium 2 plus is formed, which attracts two chloride ions and thus calcium chloride is formed. Similarly, as, in, as we have seen in the sodium chloride, 
there were no free electrons which could make current pass through pass through it same thing happens in the case of calcium chloride and it is also a very good insulator moving on let's talk about metallic bond what happens in the case of a metal let's say a sodium slab in a sodium slab there are hundreds and thousands of sodium atoms and all the atoms have the same property that is they all have a single electron in the outer shell of it and that electron is loosely bound with a nucleus so they can easily pop up from their shell and become free and move freely through the structure so what happens is this hundreds and thousands of sodium atoms give up one electrons each and those electron no longer belong to that atom but it becomes the property of the whole structure so now there are hundreds of thousands of sodium ions and same number of electrons floating all over the structure so as these free electrons can move through the structure currents can now pass through the metals so as shown in this figure these free electrons form a sea of electrons and these cations are like fixed cations in this vast sea of electrons so as these electrons can move freely through the structure these metals are highly conductive Let's talk about covalent bonding and give the example of it with silicon. Silicon is a group 4 material and it is obviously a semiconductor. It has 4 electrons in its outer shell. We can see that 2 electrons in 3s orbital and another 2 in 3p orbital. This is the structure of a silicon atom, a simplified structure. It has 4 electrons in the outer shell that are marked by blue here. So it requires another 4 electron to complete it, its octave structure. So what it does is, this silicon shares each of its electron with another neighboring silicon atom. So let's say this electron is shared with another silicon atom and a bond is formed. Here, two electrons are shared and the blue electron belongs to this silicon structure and the cross mark red electron belongs to another neighboring silicon atom the two electrons are simultaneously shared by both the silicon atoms and a bond is formed. This bond is called a covalent bond. Similar covalent bonds are formed here. Another silicon atom is sharing electrons with this silicon and a bond is formed. Similarly, another covalent bond is formed here. Another one is formed here. Thus, this silicon atom shares four of its electron with four of its neighboring silicon atoms and four covalent bonds are formed. And now, this silicon atom has 8 electrons in its outer shell and thus a stable structure is gained. This thing is better understood by this structure here. Let's say we are talking about this silicon atom, this one right here. This has as usual 4 electrons in its outer shell. What happens is, this silicon shares each of its electron with a neighboring silicon. Let's talk about the bond between this and this silicon. Here, a bond is represented with two lines corresponding to two electrons. One electron belongs to this silicon atom and another one belongs to this silicon atom. Thus, a covalent bond is formed here. Similarly, another three covalent bonds are formed here between these two silicon, here between these two silicon and here between these two silicon atoms. Thus, this silicon in the center achieves its octave which is a stable state. The same thing happens to all the electrons in this structure. Thus, this silicon forms a large structure with all the silicons sharing electrons and forming covalent bonds with four neighboring silicons. Now, we have learned that in the case of an ionic bond or an ionic compound, there are no free electrons to make conduction, right? Similar thing happens in the case of a covalent bond when the temperature is 0 Kelvin. All the electrons in the silicon structure is used up for forming bonds and thus forming a giant silicon structure. 
but what happens if we increase the temperature when the temperature is increased some of the electrons some of the electrons in this structure let's say one electron from here has gained thermal energy to break the bond and become free and move freely in the whole giant structure so when the temperature is raised some electrons gain enough energy to break away from the covalent bond so thus we can see that in a semiconductor when the temperature is 0 kelvin there is no free electron that can make conduction possible but when the temperature is increased some of the electrons may break away the covalent bonds and become free to move through the whole structure that is why when the temperature is increased the conduction of the semiconductor material increases as well now as we can see that silicon or germanium these are purely covalent but if we consider compound semiconductors let's say gallium arsenide this has some ionic percentage in it from the chart we can see that the gallium arsenide has 32 percent ionic percentage that is because the electronegativity is not same in this uh, chart the semiconductors are marked in violet you can see that there are silicon germanium arsenic these are all semiconductors don't don't actually confuse them with this pink row the color is similar but the pink is halogens and the violets are all semiconductors